I'm Elektra Wagenrad. I work for Freifunk in Berlin. I've been active there for quite a while. And uh, yeah, recently we started a project of using wireless mesh networking and the television band, which is a UHF. I guess you, are you familiar with, with the abbreviation UHF? Ultra high frequency. It used to be considered ultra high frequency, uh, but as of today, I guess we no, can no longer consider that. What has happened so far? Uh, we are all using 2.4 gigahertz Wi Fi. We're also using 5 gigahertz Wi Fi. And uh, yeah, since you have probably experience, with both frequency bands, you know that the range of the 5 gigahertz band is much, much shorter than the 2.4 gigahertz band, although it's less crowded. The 2.4 gigahertz band, it's a so-called uh, ISM band, industry, science, medical. It can be used for all kinds of applications, like heating. So you have devices that have thousands of watts just for a heating material, and you have all kinds of applications that send a continuous wave signal, like uh, video links. So it's considered to be a trash band. It's a garbage band. And that's why we are allowed to use it, because it was considered garbage. But nevertheless, it's an important infrastructure for our world of today, because any reasonable and demanding media use today, if you can't resort to an Ethernet cable, works today via Wi-Fi. 3G, 4G just is not able to handle the amount of data and it's also too pricey, at least in Germany. Um, you might tell me that it is different in your country. I would love to hear that, but uh, at least for Germany it's not true. And uh, only in Germany we have 250 million units that are equipped with Wi-Fi. And these days the mobile operators, they have found, okay, it's really pricey to handle all these demanding data streams only with our services. So they now resort to what I call mobile offloading. So they will actually use Wi-Fi in order to deliver broadband to their customers. For example, if you are a German customer of Deutsche Telekom and you receive a router for your ADSL or VDSL, you might find that it has an extra open access point only for the customers of T-Mobile. And the EU has estimated that the providers are saving 84 billion euros this year by offloading their traffic to Wi-Fi. So they're also using this resource as we do. Well, something great has happened because of the digitalization, digitalization of television. The spectral efficiency has increased by a factor of six, which means like Analog television used an 8 megahertz broad channel for the PAL television system, in, which is common in Europe or has been common in Europe, to distribute just one television channel. And uh, these days, you can use the same bandwidth in the spectrum to deliver six television channels or four television channels and several radio channels. So, effectively, a big part of the spectrum and it's the most interesting part of the spectrum because spectrum and spectrum is not the same. Well, it's all one spectrum, but if we look at different parts of it, they are not all the same. What you see here is an image I took from the New America Foundation, which have published um, a study on this issue. You see those, those areas that are labeled broadcast television. Uh, what we see here is the entire spectrum below one gigahertz. And, well, the biggest chunk of the spectrum has been traditionally been in used for television. So consider there is a small TV section below the 
FM frequency of radio. There is one slightly above in the two meter band. And in the 70 centimeter band and shorter, there is a large chunk which is called UHF, ultra high frequency, because when it was, when, when mankind started to use it, it was like, oh wow, that frequency is insanely high. So it was ultra, ultra. Okay, and now that part has become free, but well, unfortunately, not for very long. Why, why does it matter uh, to uh, use frequencies below one gigahertz? Well, that person here, if, if that person is hit by that large wave, will it affect the wave? Mildly. If that guy creates a wave himself, will it affect an oil tanker? Hardly. The basic thing that we need to understand if we look at the propagation physics of radio waves is that a very tiny wave which is hitting a large object is cancelled out or broken, so refracted. A relatively large wave hitting a small object is not really affected. That's why it makes a really big difference if you use 5 gigahertz, which is 6 centimeters in wavelength, or 2.4 gigahertz, which is 12 centimeters in wavelength. I'm going to look into that a little bit in more in detail. Well, raise your arms. Who's, who is familiar with something like that? Okay, I can just go. It's, uh... Well, there's a couple of hands that haven't been raised, so I'll cover that. All right, we measure the frequency of electromagnetic waves in hertz. Well, we do that for audio waves as well. And uh, waves propagate at 300,000 kilometers per, per second. Well, close, 297,500 something. So it, it means if we have a wave that goes through all this circle, 360 degrees in one second, it will travel 300,000 kilometers. If it does so 300 million times a second, well, then the wavelength is obviously one meter. And that's actually pretty close to the wavelength that we are experimenting at the moment with Wi-Fi. Well, if we could see electromagnetic waves, well, it would be something like that. Of course, it um, consists of an electric force and a magnetic force, and the wavelength, hence, Propagation speed divided by time is another property of those waves. So, okay, I think, I hope that we've gathered that wavelength does matter. The longer is, in principle, better with regards to range. The shorter, you have more disadvantages with regards to objects which are in the line of your electromagnetic field. Well, we are lucky we have a, a license to use the TV channels 22, 21, and 23, which gives us in total a bandwidth of 24 megahertz. Uh, traditional Wi-Fi uses 20 megahertz wide channels or 22 megahertz wide channels if we use 802.11b. N and G use 20 megahertz wide channels. So we have enough space at least temporarily, because we have a, a limited license, which is only valid for the north of Berlin, to experiment with 62 centimeters wavelength. Well, that's five times longer than your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi wavelength, which also means, um, yeah, a 24 dBi gain dish for 2.4 gigahertz is like this size. Obviously, for 62 centimeters, it's a five times the size if you want to achieve the same amount of gain. So not everything gets easier in the, in the UHF band. Um, I have here a simple Omni. This is the equivalent of the, yeah, of the little antenna you have on all those Wi-Fi routers if they have an external antenna. Yeah, it's just the equivalent. It's not exactly that length because I, here I have a little bit of plastic, which is just plastic for support which doesn't affect the radiation pattern if you mount it to a metal pole. 
But yeah, that's about the size that we're talking about. And uh, that's 2.2 dBi gain, if it works properly, which I hope. And uh, of course, it's interesting to have even better gain. So we have built an 8 dBi, hopefully 8 dBi only, and that's a whopping 2 meters 50 long, give or take. So things tend to get quite large. Well, I have to resort or turn back to politics. Um, sorry if I bore you with issues uh, from Germany, but I suppose it's the same problem in all those countries these days. So five sixths, so a, a large chunk of the spectrum is now unused, and this part has been, well, licensed for a quite long amount of time for extremely high price to the three big uh, mobile telephone operators in Germany, at least for Germany. They paid a whopping five billion for the last spectrum auction this year. And uh, in 2010, they paid another large chunk of money, an amazing amount of money for the frequencies between uh, 790 and 860 megahertz. And uh, this, year's they, this year, they acquired 710 to 790 megahertz. Well, you should expect that the German taxpayers are laughing all the way when they go to the bank to pick up that money. Well, at least that's what our politicians tell us. And uh, I wonder, am I trapped in a kindergarten? Because uh, somebody has to pay for that amount of money that all the operators pay for their spectrum license. So we're all going to pay for it, and that might be the reason why, for example, if you use LTE, which was part of that first auction, it's extremely pricey and you pay an insane amount for one gigabyte of data a month. And of course, you could use it with 51.6 megabit per second if you're lucky, but then your volume, your data amount will run out in a couple of seconds. <laughs> I don't know, didn't calculate it, but it might be less than two minutes. Correct me if uh, I'm wrong. Or give some, huh? Slightly more. Anyway, so you might have two and a half minutes of high-speed data per month. That's brilliant. Well, that's the second auction. I don't want to bore you for that, but I'm going to make this presentation at the Chaos Computer Club with more German audience, I suppose. So it's a really sad thing going on now at the moment. Um, a public resource, if you consider public broadcast television a public resource, is now privatized for a long time. And the market, of course, will handle our needs in broadband, uh, as we can all see, or not. So he, the market, like an intelligible person, is going to solve it, but, well, as we all learned, it won't. So we, as community networking people, or all the people, I think we have a different proposition to make. I and a group of other people, Spectrum activists, we have proposed to the EU Commission that a dedicated part of the UHF spectrum, which is now unused, should be used for unlicensed broadband data use. License free for everyone. The mobile operators can also use it like they already do it with our 2.4 gigahertz band. And we would all win from that. In the United States and in England and in some other countries, people are already using TV white space devices at prices of $1,000 a piece. They're not exactly a bargain. And they don't work in some areas. For example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, there is no free frequency that you could use in order to operate your TV white space device. So what are the people doing that purchase such a device and they find it doesn't work? Well, they just fake the geolocation of their device and then it works. And now the FCC is complaining and they say, okay, well, since the device is already cost $1,000, just adding a GPS and making it mandatory that the device detail, detects itself where it is located, so the user cannot fake the data anymore, is a reasonable step that we have to go. 
Another proposition, well, it was proposed, but nobody, I think, really took it serious that the devices just detect if there is somebody already using that frequency, which would, of course, affect television receivers because they don't broadcast in that band, they merely receive. So you could interfere with somebody trying to pick up the television signal from some brain dead television station with your Wi-Fi use. So it was discussed, but I don't think it, yeah, it will have any reasonable um, hope to be used. So hence our proposition to say, okay, we want a dedicated band, just give us a certain amount of bandwidth that we could use. We will all benefit from it. Wi-Fi is such an important resource for us all. And of course, we don't want, or at least I, I hope you agree, that a public resource is privatized for the profit of a few and we all have to pay for it. Am I boring you? Too much politics? Well, so where do we start? We need some radios that work in that frequency. A few prototypes are available. Some work with software-defined radios, so they're very pricey because in order to deliver 20 megahertz of modulation, it becomes quite, quite public, uh, complicated, like the device that you have shown me could probably do that, and even more. But yeah, we still need the radio modules for that, and it will be pricey. So I have chosen a more hands-on approach, which has been in use by radio amateurs and all kinds of radio applications every day. I use frequency shifting. What you see here in the metal boxes is the blue, the blue PCP is a, is a stock Wi-Fi router that works in the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's a Dragino MS-14, which is also sold as the Mesh Potato 2.0. So if you know me for a longer time, you might know that I have been involved in that project. So that's the second generation of the Mesh Potato and also made in Shenzhen. So I do up and down conversion of an existing 802.11n implementation from 2.4 gigahertz to the desired frequency band that I want. And the beauty of that solution is like I can just reprogram my local oscillator in my mixer. Well, I'm going to explain that in more detail and just operate on any frequency that I want. As long as it's sizable enough to hold my modulation, I can broadcast at 30 megahertz if I want to. I can broadcast at 3 gigahertz if I want to. I just change the configuration of the filters and the frequency of my local oscillator and then I'm going to do that, which is brilliant. I think. So the basics is like, um, yeah, who, who has heard about multiplicative mixing? All right, all right. Well, there is uh, an, another type of mixing that you usually have on, on audio mixers, but multiplicative mixing, it takes two or more signals and it creates a mixture of the signals as you see in the next slide. Here is an example. We have a signal of 1,000 megahertz, hence 1 gigahertz, and 600 megahertz. I label them F1, frequency 1, and F2. If you add them to a multiplicative mixer, you will get four frequencies on the outside of the mixer. Uh, what you put in, it also comes out. So obviously 600 megahertz and 1,000 megahertz will come out on the other side, but also the addition and the subtraction of the two frequencies. Um, this technology is everywhere. Like, um, for example, if you use a radio these days, a FM radio, it also does exactly this in order to create a frequency of 10.7 megahertz where it processes your analog audio. It's called the intermediate frequency and the design of such a radio is called superhead. If it does dual frequency conversion, it's a double superhead. Well, obviously, I'm only using this for frequency shifting. Uh, in the next slide, you see the actual frequencies that I'm using in our experiment. I tune the Wi-Fi device to 2,432 megahertz, and I mix it with 1,950 megahertz. And the output that I'm interested in is 482 megahertz, which is hence very easy to filter 
away from these three other frequencies because the frequency gap is quite big. I could use any other frequency of the Wi-Fi device and I could, yeah, I've used, um, uh, I there's a fractional divider in my, in my local oscillator so I could use use a fraction of those frequencies as well. Like I can tune uh, my output to 1.25 hertz exactly. So in 1.25 hertz, well, which is a mere theory because there's some frequency drift. Well, that's actually the block diagram of what I'm doing. Um, if I'm proceeding too fast, I'm, I welcome all your questions. Please uh, don't feel shy. Also, if you don't want to hear all the technical stuff, please, please tell me. Um, so that's basically what, I'm, what I have implemented here in the prototype. Here on the left-hand side, you see the local oscillator, which is tuned, in this case, to 1950 megahertz. And the signal from the Wi-Fi device is fed into the mixer. Then the filter separates the frequencies from each other, so I can only use the 482 megahertz. It's amplified, filtered, amplified, filtered, and then it goes to an RF switch, which I need because the system by itself is full duplex, but Wi-Fi radio is half duplex. So I have to switch if I want to use just one antenna. If I have two antennas, I could actually go without the RF switch. But it's, of course, handy to have just one antenna instead of two. When I receive, the signal comes in at 482 megahertz, is filtered, because I don't want to amplify anything else. There is a low noise amplifier in order to boost the signal because filtering and mixing, it costs attenuation. So in order to, to even that out, I have to amplify it. And then it goes into the receiving port of the router. And uh, in order to make all this work, I had to use a router that has a chipset which has a receiving port and a transmission port. And uh, the chipset used in the Dragino, it's an Atero slash Qualcomm chipset AR9331. It does just that. I had to patch the driver because actually <laughs> the, the receiving port is never used. In none of these devices, the receiving port has been ever used. It's disabled because they have found uh, an issue with the switch which is supposed to decide on which antenna port do I have a better signal. So by default, all those devices, even though they have two antennas and they have all the stuff loaded on the board, they never use it. I had to patch it away in order to be, to, to be able to actually use that feature. I was wondering why I don't receive my signal <laughs> for a while. Okay. Yeah, that's a little bit more in detail. You see the gray cables on the right side. Uh, the one on top, which is uh, connected to the lower port, is transmit, and the other one is receive. And then there is all this processing, process, processing on the board that I have shown you on the block diagram. And on the left-hand side, there is the antenna. Yeah, it's implemented in this box, hand-soldered in a trailer park in Berlin. The result, I connected it to a transmitter tester. Um, yeah, that's when you send uh, broadcast packages at 802.11b data rate. Um, that's what you see in the spectrum analyzer. You see a little bit of overswing on the right side, but I tested the 2.4 gigahertz part. It already was present in the router, so garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I've shown you in the block diagram, basically between each step where I process the, the waves, there is a filter. Well, you've seen that uh, picture at the beginning of the slide. Um, in the next picture, you will see it mounted on a church in Berlin Friedrichshain. But here it's only visible from the backside, so you just see a piece of metal sheet. It's a B quad. Uh, we used to build them ourselves for Freifunk, for example, because it's a very easy to build antenna. Who has built a B quad before? Ah, one, two. 
It's a really decent antenna, just uh, 10 dBi with a reflector. Quite decent, easy to build, and uh, yeah, very successful. Yeah, so why, why all this? Um, the biggest advantage is like if you have obstructing objects in your Fresnel zone, which is uh, more mighty at this wavelength because the, the diameter of the Fresnel zone is a function of the wavelength. But objects that are inside, particularly bushes, trees, they also attenuate the signal, but they don't attenuate it as far as in the 2.4 gigahertz range. So, for example, if you, if you go through trees, you have at least 5 dB less attenuation compared to a 2.4 gigahertz signal. And of course, the frequency is unused. So what you see here is my Fresnel zone between my kitchen and the church 600 meters away. And uh, it starts with green leaves and trees and uh, whatever. And uh, you, you would have absolutely no chance to, chance to pick up a 2.4 gigahertz signal unless you have 24 dBi dishes on each side. And here I'm just picking it up with a simple omnidirectional antenna. Actually, one like this. Well, that was pretty fast, I suppose. Yeah, we were supported by our local uh, regulator for uh, television and radio channels. They uh, supported us with, with a fund. So, yeah, I'm open for your questions. That's really cool. Thank you. Not only if you want to be really, really helpful and help us a lot, I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who would like to support and to help with this kind of work. But we don't know who are the trustworthy organizations who do this kind of lobbying in our countries. I'm sure that you have the right contacts and it would be extremely helpful if you could look at, you know, neighboring European countries, ask your friends who work with you whether they know who's doing that and send it on the battle mesh list. I'm sure there's plenty of people who would like to, pro uh, to support this kind of activity. Well, I'm afraid I'm probably not the best person for lobby work. Um, for human contact, you are. Um, <laughs> okay. M might be. Uh, actually, the MABB, they... Uh, when there was the Repu Repu Republica in, in Berlin, they had a meeting and they also invited politicians and uh, regulators and they also were very proud to present our project. But of course, uh, the corridors of power are ocean-wide. How do you say that? So, and there is a, a large, large capital interest inside, but actually they would benefit too. They would benefit too from being able to use the same band for free, additional to the band that they you can use exclusively. Aren't you afraid that they just uh, use your signs uh, to sell this bandwidth? After you found out how it works, you like your uh, pathfinder, and then they sell it to uh, to the most. Um it's, it's not that I have made a big invention. This is just a conventional radio frequency engineering. Um, it's, it's very common to do that. So it's not something groundbreaking new. And uh, you can also, also use similar frequencies, for example, for personal mobile radio or a family radio service in the US. That would be the equivalent. And, um, but only, of course, with narrow, narrow band on a very limited resource. And uh, you, you, ha you have to consider that the modulation of Wi-Fi is pretty broadband, so the range is also lower than compared to a personal mobile radio device. It's uh, certainly a big surplus, a big gain, and it would be particularly very good for areas that are underserviced at the moment, because you could reach people living behind a forest much easier than you can do it with 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. I have a 
have two questions. Did you have to tune some way the timings of Wi-Fi of Wi-Fi to get it work properly? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And another question. And the other question is, what is the uh, maximum throughput that you were able to achieve? Okay. Um, I'm still uh, in the stage of uh, prototyping to answer your second question, and uh, obviously I have some uh, phase shifting going on in all the processing that I'm doing. So I only get MCS3 as the maximum data rate at the moment. I will have to further improve my work in order to gain the full bandwidth. But uh, the lower ranges, the, the lower uh, data rates are not affected. And um, in principle, um, the modulation bandwidth stays the same. So frequency shifted or not, uh, given that I don't mess up the signal, like uh, the signal quality, like uh, the phase quality stays the same, the data rates should be exactly the same, like if you use it at 2.4 gigahertz. There is a difference because any mixer that I introduce and all the filters, it will reduce the signal to noise ratio. So I've spent a lot of time on optimizing that. So like having a low noise amplifier, and uh, having filters that don't attenu attenuate the signal so much. And also the mixer itself introduces some additional noise, which also makes the signal to noise ratio suffer. So um, my proposal is if we could just have a dedicated band for Wi-Fi in the UHF area, uh, somebody could just tune their chipsets that they already make for 2.4 gigahertz down to that frequency and just use their ex existing technology. Um, the, st the stuff that I'm making is just yeah, an intermediate solution. Um, the technology can be used for MIMO as well, but I would have to multiply the amount of, of converters, like or build one converter for dual stream MIMO. Actually, that would be a good thing, because another interesting property of the UHF band is like if you shoot with your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi through a tree, um, you don't have vertical or horizontal polarization fields any longer because there is so much refraction going on that uh, you can turn your antenna around and uh, if you're lucky it doesn't even give you the slightest difference in your in your signal to noise ratio whether in uh, undisturbed uh, linear polarization you would expect a loss of 20 dBi if you turn the antenna 90 degrees around and that's exactly what you see in UHF so uh, even after shooting through a couple of trees if i rotate the antenna i have a severe impact so the polarization is not as bad affected by, of course, because the wave is, wavelength is much longer. So uh, dual stream MIMO would work brilliantly, like you have a horizontal and the vertical polarization, and you could almost perfectly separate the MIMO streams from each other. And yeah, double the bandwidth. I guess you're going to iterate on this prototype, and uh, do you have some idea of what the costs are to make this frequency shifter, this, this uh, bi-direction? Um, I guess the complete system in a metal box with everything inside uh, could cost $80 or less. Very, very what kind of power do we have? Uh, 300 milliwatts at the moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Um, in the mixer, I lose about uh, 1.5 decibels. Um, and the filters, I have spent a lot of time working on the filters because I needed to separate the signals pretty, pretty well. And I think I'm in the range of like 2 decibel of loss for each filter. So the final, the final word is not spoken, it's like an iteration. And uh, I hope to be uh, ready to have a design that I'm really happy of and that will run at top speed by the end of the year. What's the total loss right now? It's probably in the range of around 6 decibels. Yeah. How old 
muted myself. Um, I read of uh, ultra wideband uh, for the use of low distance uh, communication. Um, have you got an idea how much it would cost to um, to build such a um, um, transmitter and receiver for ultra wideband? Sorry, sorry, no, uh, I don't because I didn't look inside. But I guess it's uh, it's quite complicated, and um, I myself I'm more interested in range rather than uh, short range extreme bandwidth. There is also some ISM band I think in 20, 24 gigahertz and 60 gigahertz where you have light like properties even more than we already have, uh, which is extremely short range. But there you can have extremely high bandwidth. You seem to want to add something? It's possible you misinterpreted what ultra wideband is. Ultra wideband was something that would actually, about eight years ago, pollute a lot of frequencies at a very low level. Yeah, yeah I, you understood that, right? already full, yes, because everyone is uh, sending and, so, and stuff. Um, maybe in that area when everything is full and nothing is uh, working anymore because uh, everyone is sending, maybe um, UVB could be another way to still send and receive. There is a, with ultra wideband it means that you use an extreme broad bandwidth and um, the amount of energy that you have per hertz is very low, but you would still add to the noise floor of all the applications that are running on all those frequencies. So somehow you would affect them all. You would affect them on a low scale, but if you ask those people, they don't want to be affected. <laughs> Sorry. They reduced already the um, the amount of Sendeleistung. Uh, they already yeah they already reduced it very extreme. If they wouldn't have re reduced it. Ultra wideband could uh, reach far uh, reach ma more far um, away uh, nodes yet. But but now they they um, reduced um, the transmission power already allowed transmission power that there is. Uh, not uh, too much interference with other frequencies already. They already uh, reduced it, so it's, so it's merely kind of a Bluetooth or something. Mm. You, have to, you have to understand that this discussion is uh, quite out of the scope of this presentation. Uh, well, no, 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 you don't have to be sorry. It's a certainly an interesting subject uh, yes. to discuss. Uh, this project is about getting more range, yes. and ultra wideband would be, yeah, you have um, more data speed, but not a, not a particularly high range. Actually, you have to understand that uh, modulation bandwidth is, is a function of the range. For example, uh, radio amateurs, they have this sport they call QRPP. QRP means reduce your power. QRPP use your, reduce your power to an extremely low level. And uh, they, for example, they use Morse code where the dot is a minute and the dash is three minutes. And um, you have to separate the sim symbols because otherwise the dot and the dash would be just one. So the, the inter symbol difference would be another minute. So uh, broadcasting the character A takes three minutes to show that you're now sending a new symbol. Then one minute for the dot, another minute for the gap between the dot and the dash. The subsequent dash would be three minutes. And then you have to wait three minutes to make it clear that the symbol is now over. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> and also reception doesn't work by hand. They use a Fourier analysis of the, of the noise floor. But they manage to broadcast from here to New Zealand with less than one watt on shortwave. So you can see here we have a very, very low bandwidth, but an extremely high range. And uh, Wi-Fi is rather the opposite, and ultra-wideband is extremely the opposite of that. If you would get a chunk in this UHF band for unlicensed use, what are the power levels? We should the same as for Wi-Fi? 
Well, the beauty of of uh, of it in our case was that we we wrote the application and we just said we want uh, forward transmission power, effective radiated transmission power. So, yeah, eight dB gain of the antenna and uh, 500 milliwatts would just be that. No, not exactly six. Well, anyway. <laughs> All right, another question. Uh, from what I can see in modern Wi-Fi hardware and driveways, um, chipsets do support using a lower channel bandwidth. You can, like, in ATH9K, reduce it to 10 megahertz or even 5 megahertz. Would that work with the same uh, circuitry you already built? Yeah, I'm already uh, using that because um, Actually, for, for measurements, I use uh, software-defined radios like the HackerF, and the HackerF only has 8 megahertz bandwidth. So in order to be able to see a complete signal, I actually tune OpenWT to use 5 megahertz bandwidth. So we can effectively use 5, 10, 20, and 40 megahertz. And uh, I've seen that Ubiquiti, they offer 8 megahertz bandwidth as well. That would be interesting because the TV channels were 8 megahertz wide. But um, if somebody finds a fix to do that with OpenWT, I would be very glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please, please, if somebody finds a way to, to modulate an 8 megahertz wide channel, that would be perfect. More questions? Uh, uh, as far as I know, Felix, I, I talked to Felix about that using, uh, so Felix is the ATH9K maintainer and I talked about that issue um, and he said that it is possible but it's not so easy to include that in mainline Linux. That's the, the biggest problem because at the moment the Mac H0211 abstraction layer is not aware of that because, no, it is so. It, you can even use, uh, for example, three megahertz wide channels. Yeah, so, well, if, even if that's not for mainline, it would be brilliant to have, yeah. especially for that purpose. It would be, a, well, that would be a reason to put it into mainline as well. Uh, if there is a check that it's actually a TV white space device, but uh, the 2.4 gigahertz router in my circuitry, it doesn't know what I'm doing to the signal, of course. <laughs> All right. Well, one more question? No. Well, oh. I <laughs> First of all, this is awesome. Thanks. Like this is really, really cool. Um, I'm wondering if you have visualized the the packet stream. Like actually, like uh, if you, if you get to it to be the the size of a channel, then you could actually see if you could capture it on a on an antenna, and like with a TV, I mean. Well, um, I would like to uh, to see an analysis of the IQ data. That's that's the part that I'm looking for, because. Um, I have this, uh, yeah, I use RTL SDR with uh, DVB-T sticks in order to measure. Then the next luxury step was to use the HackerF. But um, yeah, I have to find somebody that allows me to use their gear to analyze the IQ data because that could help me debugging why I don't get the highest data rates. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much for your attention and your kind interest in all those questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.